I'd like to introduce Jason Parker. Now, Jason is a stroke survivor himself and has bravely agreed to share with us this evening his own personal experience with mental health after his stroke. We are so grateful for Jason for sharing his story and sadly not an uncommon experience with us. So please, can I welcome Jason? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. So I'm Jason Park, and my day job is I'm a partner at KPMG. Don't say boo. Um, I, uh, some, some, somewhat ironically, I look after our healthcare practice, and um, outside of that, I'm also chair of Bliss, the national neonatal charity for babies born too sick and too soon. Um, so why am I here today? 2019, I had a stroke caused by an AVM, uh, aged 45. Um, I was fit, I had just come back from cycling across the Alps um, with a bunch of friends and raised loads of money for Bliss. And I was out in the garden one day raking some leaves and then just thought it was weird. I could see a football and yet I couldn't kick it. And then uh, in seconds, minutes, I couldn't feel my leg, my feet, my arms, and I felt like my, my mouth was twitching and, and that kind of stuff. So I lost the left-hand side of everything, uh, couldn't, couldn't move anything. I was in a hoist in a wheelchair for three months and then in, um, in hospital for up to seven months. Uh, there were less, less obvious stuff with it as well. So um, I noticed that I became very sensitive to noise and stuff like today. If this had been a year ago, two years ago, I would have found this overwhelming noise, sensory overload, all that kind of stuff. Um, and mental health was, was, was a challenge. And I'll come, come back, up, back to that in a sec. Um, other stuff I noticed was uh, my wife's a consultant psychiatrist um, who is very good and grounding for me. She said, basically, my personality became myself on steroids, which is probably really irritating. <laughs> so my, um, well, I know it's really irritating. Uh, so my day job is being a management consultant, which is irritating anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but, but what does that mean? It means I always know the answer to everything. I am super driven, want to get things done, want to make change happen, all that kind of stuff. And I'm quite judgy. So um, that's, that's not great in every situation, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Some of that is great as you recover from a, from a stroke. So I had seven months to learn how to do everything again, to wiggle my toe and all that kind of stuff. Um, at the time, the, the sort of conventional wisdom was around neuroplasticity, and there was, I was told by my neurologist that the six-month window is really, really important in your recovery. So sort of smash everything you can in that, in that period of time. And then you're kind of done, was what I was told. So what you get back in six months, that'll be it. So if we go back to my personality and driven, want to get things done, cycling through the Alps, all a bit silly, um, I threw everything into recovery. So I was naughty. So on the hospital ward, I was the one who was sneaking around in my wheelchair when I should have been. I was getting out of my bed when I shouldn't be getting out of my bed. I was going to the gym and holding onto a rail as best I can to pull myself up, that kind of stuff, wondering, asking the chief exec, who I actually knew, um, why is your gym closed on a weekend? When, and I was the only guy there on the stroke ward doing all of these things. Why do I say that? Because I think I have learned that that six month window, I think, is, is not right because uh, this is three years on now and I'm still making enormous progress. And there's a thing about probably mental state and determination that actually can make an, an enormous difference. Let me talk to you about care I received. I would say the acute care that I got was absolutely brilliant from ambulance to assessment to being popped in a bed. Uh, my local hospital was all fantastic and I have nothing but praise for, m for my time there, which was, which was brilliant. I love those guys. And I, I go back regularly to talk to patients and just, just share my experience on it and try and give people a bit of hope that, you, you know, look, I'm walking, you probably don't notice any difference in me now, which is great. Um, I would compare that to what you get when you leave hospital and then you go into the community and it is stark, the difference that you, you see. So uh, technically everything was there. So day one, I am discharged. I'm still in a wheelchair, can't do much. There are ramps outside my house and I've got the handles to help me get in, get in the house and into the bath and all that kind of stuff. So tick, tick, tick. A, se a succession of people came to see me that day to check on my mental health and to check on my uh, rehab needs and all those kind of things. They all came with a checklist. I never saw anybody ever again. The checklist on mental health was almost hilarious in hindsight. So it was like, have you had suicidal thoughts? Yes, quite often recently. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I hope you feel better. <laughs> the counseling, I had one counseling session 
who told me I should give up my job. I was 45, I'm a partner at a big four firm, blah, blah, blah. For me, it was a big deal to get back to working for loads of reasons, we can come back to that. But being told that actually everybody stops working when this happens, it's a massive blow. And it was like, really, and she was lovely, but it was just that I did not need to hear that. I wanted hope at that point, and I did not get that. Um, I thought carefully about privilege in all of this. So what did I do? Okay, so I'm a consultant, so I'm going back to the beginning, what did I do? I tried to fix everything. So I was like, do you know what? I'll pay for all this myself. So I went out and I got rehab, I got counselling. Uh, my wife's a psychiatrist helped me to navigate the system, so she got me gamma knife surgery, which wasn't discussed. Um, I was just told to sort of go home and it should fix itself, or it might pop again, who knows, in, in a number of years' time. So I, and I understand healthcare because that's my day job, so I was able to navigate the system had the means and resources to be able to get what I needed to. And I often wonder, um, did that significantly affect my outcome? Probably. Um, but some of that is about determination and mental state. Some of that is about resource. And I think it's really poor that we have people who are discharged from hospital after re receiving wonderful treatment, then being kind of left at home. I mean, what sort of, what sort of life is that? It's pretty poor. To turn to mental health, um, I had a lot of time to think about this stuff. So you sat in a hospital bed, you can't really move. Um, I wondered whether I would be able to work again. I wondered whether I wanted to work again. Um, I had new perspective. You know, you, you look back and thinking, well, why on earth did I used to get stressed about X, Y, and Z? Um, but I did realize it was important to me. And so I became, I added that focus to, do you know what, I'm gonna go back to work. And so I was, there was no changing my mind. I was going back. And ideally after three months, and uh, everyone was just laughing at me, just going, this is ridiculous. People take years to recover from this. Uh, but I was kind of on a mission to do that kind of stuff. So I went back after seven months full time to KPMG as a partner. And it was a, probably a ridiculous thing to do, quite frankly. Um, I was completely blagging it. I, was, I had terrible fatigue. I was struggling with sensory stuff. Um, and teams had just come in, so COVID was, had, had just started. And I was, I was all over the place, but I didn't show anyone. I didn't want anybody to see weakness, um, but, but it was there. Um, in turn, I'm also certain that that has significantly improved my recovery. So I was kind of putting myself out there and always trying to go and push myself into new things has, I think, made me recover much quicker than I would have done before. So I would not advise anyone to go back after seven months, um, but I would advise people to not change your goals in life, etc., because you've had a setback like this. Um, in terms of mental health, what, so what did, what did I feel? I, I, I think a range of things. So yes, there was a bit of sort of suicidal stuff, and I'd say that was, you know, not a, yeah, it is, of course it is a big deal, but it was not a frequent thing. There was an occasional, do you know what, this is awful. I'm trying, to, my five-year-old was there with me. I don't want her to see me like this. Um, but, but not all the time. And a lot of anxiety. Some of that was logical. So it was, you have had something pop in your head. It was an AVM. Um, is this going to happen again? Nobody could tell me that. Um, so that is on your mind all the time. You know, mortality, is this going to happen again? Some of it became quite illogical. So it was, it's approaching the one year anniversary on my stroke, therefore I probably will have another stroke on December the 9th. And honestly, for about two months before that, I was like, December's coming, December's coming. And that's really logical, and n almost no amounts of counselling can help you with that. But um, you kind of need to know when you're talking to people who've had stuff like this, because your emotions are up and down all the time. I, I often describe it as like big weather systems coming in that you can see coming, but they come really fast. So whether it's anxiety, depression, these things come and go really quickly in a way that they didn't before. Um, so there's a bit of the illogical stuff. I think my self-esteem was like really rocked. So um, I would think you would all be judging me or that you could see that there's something wrong with me. And I still kind of think that. So coming to talk to you today, um, a bit of me is a lot more nervous than I would have been three or four years ago doing something like this. Because I keep thinking, can I do it? Because the old me would have done this all the time. And the new me, oh God, because I've got all these things to think about or worry about. And then I'm looking at the step going, I hope I don't trip on the step. Um, will there be a handrail? All that kind of stuff. I don't need a handrail. I mean, my daughter... <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing like kids to give you feedback, is it? Is it? She goes, Dad, why do you go down the stairs holding the rail like an old man? I'm like, 
Uh, a, because I think I'm probably more of an old man than I used to be. And then I realised it was a comfort thing. It's like, I had to lean over there just in case I fell. And she goes, right, walk down the stairs without, and just got me into a regime of uh, just kind of doing, doing that kind of stuff. But actually, the self-esteem is a struggle. And when you go back to work, you've got all that 10, 20-fold. You're like, oh, is everybody staring at me? What do I look like on Teams? Is everybody... T- um, walking on eggshells around me, all that kind of stuff. So all that stuff is whirring around your head along with trying to do your day job and all the rest of it. So, so you've got all of that stuff that's going on. And then there's something about getting used to disability. So it was weird getting a blue badge. So I, DVLA said I was a- able to drive again after speaking to GP, all that kind of stuff, but I got a blue badge. And I was like shocked to see this thing because I did not think myself to be disabled. Um, and then the sort of, badge that comes with the badge if you see what I mean the sort of stigma that comes with all of that is is really interesting how people look at you when you park your car what they say to you when you park your car because there is a strange logic in Britain which is if you park in a disabled space and you have a car you are there for a benefits cheat so I have been called I won't say it because we're on um, I've been called all kinds of things in Sainsbury's car park because I have a car and so there's, a, there's something about you're not allowed a job and be disabled. So there's like all of this strange thing that you're having to get used to. I've learned to laugh at all of that stuff. And I've learned to be comfy talking about disability at work and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But again, you would never think that you would have to also start to think about that. And you've got a definition on yourself, which is a bit of a judgment of I am disabled. I am a stroke survivor. I'm not sure I quite like the phrase, all those kind of things. I'm still me. Um, but you've got these labels on you, which then, in turn, you see that other people look at you with those labels. So even at KPMG, who are lovely and were amazing with me when I was off and all that kind of stuff, I'm still the guy they go to on World Disability Day because I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm vaguely affable. <laughs> I can talk without falling over. Ah, oh, tick, he does the disability bit. So, I mean, they're all lovely people, but it's a, it's a bit of a judgment thing that Jason can talk about disability. I can talk about lots of other things, and I'm happy to talk about lots of that, and I'm still happy to do that stuff. It's completely fine, because actually the more we talk about it, I think the the better it is. I was asked about family, and I um, mustn't cry. Um, It's really hard. Um, There's something about you don't realise it's as hard for them as it is for you. So they're walking on eggshells around you the whole time. (coughs) My wife was brilliant. My son got an eating disorder. And my little one was was hilarious, actually. My little one was four at the time. Um, I got a message, got a call from the school to say that she'd kicked the head teacher. (laughs) Uh, Right in the shins. (laughs) But she didn't sit. Mrs. Kenny called me and said, Yes, yeah, Scarlett is normally a lovely child, but she kicked me in the shin. She didn't say anything. She pulled a face and left. <laughs> it turns out she wasn't happy that her dad was in hospital. And so you've got all this stuff going on. And you're consumed in your own stuff. And um, the support you get is in- incredible. Um, so I can never repay them enough. So, so where am I today? Try and finish on a chirpier note. Um, so I think really good. The gamma knife surgery I had, so I was in Queen Square with Mr. Kitchen in May 2020 had that and then you don't know the outcome of that until until you have a angio two or three years later um i now have in my downstairs loo a letter from mr kitchen that says my avm has been obliterated and to get on with my enjoying my life which is brilliant um i can kind of stumble around a 10k run and then i come in moaning about that and my wife says at least you can run 10k (laughs) um i can get on my bike and do all that kind of stuff I went skiing, I fell over about eight times, but I still did it. And going back to the pushing myself to things that, always pushing myself into new stuff. Um, and I'm still getting better. So that six month window thing, it'd be really interesting if there was more research on um, how is it for people beyond that six month period, because I think my, my stuff is getting better and better, it's still getting better. Um, I filmed a lot of the stuff and put it on Twitter um, when I was going through it, because I was bored, didn't know what to do, and then like a million people started watching videos of me stumbling around a ward. Um, because apparently not many people, when they uh, film this stuff, when you're actually going through it, um, especially at a younger age. Um, and so I get all of these messages going, oh, you're an inspiration, it's marvellous. 
I don't buy that at all. Like, it's, it's nice that people say nice things. I don't feel it. I feel like I wish this had never happened to me. Of course I do. Um, and I mourn my previous self um, because, and I think probably for the first year afterwards, I spent the time battling against my former self. So it's like, I'm going to show you that I'm exactly the same person I was for before, and perhaps even better. Maybe I'll run a 10K faster than I did before. All those sorts of impossible bars I had set myself. And it took quite a long time to realize that A, I had a blue badge, B, I wasn't going to be able to do all of those things. But actually, I ticked off a list of what do I like doing and all that kind of stuff and what is possible. And I can, there's pretty much nothing I can't do now. I can't, my little one tells me and, she, and laughs in my face at me. She arranges an obstacle course outside. <laughs> and I've got her over 100 metres. Like, I could smash her by 50 metres. And I enjoy that because I'm competitive, <laughs> right? <laughs> She's clocked that if she sets up an obstacle course outside in the garden, I'm not so good going left to right, left to right, left to right, picking up a hoop, all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't matter, does it? Um, so there's a lot that I can't do, but I've turned that around from what I can't do to what I can do, which is great. Um, and... I, I have perspective on everything and um, I think I've learned to apply that sort of competitive horrible management consultant behaviour to um, kind of just recovering and continuing to recover and so if I can help anybody through my story through my journey I am really happy to do that um, so that's me thank you very much <laughs>